Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It is the second of the eighth month on our Creator's calendar as we reckon it from the scriptures, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, Hanok, Yobelim, and all of those that are confirmed amongst themselves. And it is the 15th of October on the Gregorian calendar, the year 2022. And we're continuing with Ralph Ehrenstein's sermon on El's great name. <clears throat> so we've already gone over the first two things that he's proposed about the great name of our El, and in particular, the means for which he does the things that he does, our deliverance in in uh, our eternal deliverance is what he's magnifying the most throughout this speech or the sermon. So continuing with what he's going through, we are on preposition three. And it says, the third thing proposed in the general method was to show what deliverance he works for his name's sake. Deliverance is either temporal, ruachni, or spiritual, or eternal. And though El, for his name's sake, works many temporal deliverances for his assembly and people. As you see in Yisrael, here, Psalm 106, verse 9, 10, 11, 21, 22, 43, 45, 46, and all this for his name's sake also. He also delivered the assembly of Scotland, or Caledonia, many a time, for his name's sake. He delivered us from paganism, for his name's sake, when he first sent El the good news light to our land. And this is a miscomprehension on his part. His original ancestors, the Caledonians, you can read in their own history, were a pious people. And they followed the laws of the altar from the time they left Mitzrayim, right contemporary with the birth of Moshe and the death of the firstborn. They left before they were they're murdered. All the way through until the advent of our Mashiach. And it was foretold that at his advent, they would start to go turn aside and then have a rude messenger or a rude uh, way of having the good news brought to them. And when they had turned aside from the laws of the altar, they first had ro the uh, Romans come in, attack them, and enslave some of them. They were actually used by the Romans, who the leadership of Rome from the Julius line was from the line of Zara. They were also survivors from Troy, but they had been paganized. And Rome actually used them and had their own brothers from Yahuda, the MacDonald clan, and the other branches of them as the slaves that they are using for their siege engines at the sacking of Yarushalayim. And it was during that time that uh, one of the brothers or one of the Caledonians had found the crown of Shalomo. All of this information is in the ancient history of Caledonia, which I'll link in the description, and I'll send to you all in an email if you don't already have it. But it is a history of the people of Caledonia, who, which later became Scotland, it's also written in their why. And both the Scots and the Caledonians were related. They're both from the 12 tribes. All right. Caledonians were predominantly from Yahuda and Louis, with a mixture of about five other clans total at the end of their migrations and coming to what we call Scotland, but they landed at Montrose. And then in the course of time, the Scots migrated with them, and then others came in to where the whole of the 12 tribes is in Britain itself. And they've also migrated to America. But it's predominantly represented as Ephraim in Britain and the half-tribe of Manasseh in America. These things were known and written about prolifically in the 1800s, and it's only through modern confusion, the Counter-Reformation, and things of that nature that we don't know these things so well. But all the history is there. All the information is out there. You just have to look for it. He says, he delivered the assembly of Caledonia for or many a time for his name's sake. He delivered us from paganism for his name's sake when he sent the good news light to our land. He delivered us from popery 
for his name's sake, at the esteemed Reformation, which was here carried on by solemn national covenants that were the esteem of our land, whatever contempt is now put upon them. And then it was the covenanters of Scotland that he's referring to. He delivered us from parlacy and arbitrary power and tyranny at the merciful revolution, meaning Cromwell's revolution, right? For his name's sake. And he has delivered us from time to time from many attempts of enemies that were seeking to raise us to the foundation, as some are subtly doing at this day by damnable errors which strike at the heart or which strike at the foundation of all religion. I mean, whatever assembly deliverance or temporal deliverance of this sort to a visible assembly Elohim works for his namesake. Yet it is that spiritual or ruachni and eternal deliverance, tipped by Yisrael's deliverance, that the name of El is most concerned with and exalted by. Therefore, I especially speak of this everlasting deliverance in Mashiach. And right here, he's talking about the wilderness journey of the children as a type of that eternal deliverance that our Mashiach is, is bringing about for his people in parable form. So it's another thing that you can look at. And there's actually a gentleman who wrote a book about just the wilderness journey of the children and what it all entailed. I haven't read it all, but it was very interesting what I had read about it. It says, and therefore, if the question be, what deliverance of this sort he works for his name's sake, I answer, there is no part of this great deliverance, but the name of Yahuwah is engraven upon it. He who causes it to be, right? He who is, who was, and who is to come. Kepha explains it as the fact that the Father is the self-existent one who did not come into being. And we exist because he is and did not come into being. So all things are in that nature. This is, there is no part of this great deliverance, but the name of Yahuwah is engraven upon it as being what he works for his name's sake. I shall offer a few instances thereof from the election or from election to esteem all the parts of deliverance that lie betwixt these two words from everlasting to everlasting are brought about for his name's sake wherefore did he elect any sinners from eternity it was for his name's sake to show his absolute sovereignty in making vessels of unmerited tender loving kindness of whom he pleased quote and that he might make known the riches of his esteem to them, unquote. Romans 9.23 He has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be kadosh, set apart, and without blame before him in love, quote, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by, Mashi or by Yahushua Mashiach to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the esteem of his favor. Ephesians 1, 4, 5, 6. 2. Wherefore did he redeem any sinners by the blood of his eternal Son? It was for his name's sake. Ephesians 1, 7. Quote, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his favor, wherein he has abounded towards us in all hokma, or wisdom and prudence, unquote. The redemption of Yisrael is designed and ordered for the esteem of the El of Yisrael. Quote, Sing you Shemaim, for Yahuwah has redeemed Yaakov, and esteemed himself in Yisrael, unquote. Yeshayahu 44.22 Number 3. Wherefore does he call any sinners effectually? 
It is for his name's sake. This is illustrated at large by the emissary. Quote, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but Elohim has chosen the foolish things of this world, unquote, and etc. 1 Corinthians 26 through 31. Quote, he has delivered us and called us with a set apart calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and favor, which he purposed in Mashiach before the earth began. Unquote. 2 Timothy 1 9. Hence the set apart ones ascribe their conversion and quickening to the name of El, and to the favor of El. Quote, By favor I am what I am, unquote, says Shaul, 1 Corinthians 15.10. Quote, not unto us, not unto us, but unto your name be the esteem, unquote. Psalm 115, 1. 4. Wherefore does he declare right and pardon any guilty sinner? It is even for his name's sake. Yeshiyahu 43.25 Quote, I, even I, am he that blots out your transgression for my name's sake, and remember your sins no more. Unquote. And Romans 3.24.25.26 we are declared right freely by his favor through the redemption that is in Yahushua Mashiach, whom Elohim has set forth to be a propitiation through belief in his blood, to declare right, or sorry, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, unquote, and etc. Again, five, wherefore does he adopt any child of wrath into his family? It is for his name's sake. Ephesians 1 5. Quote, we are predestined to the adoption of children, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the esteem of his favor. Unquote. Again, 6. Wherefore does he set apart any filthy sinner? It is even for his name's sake. 1 Corinthians 1 30. Quote, Mashiach is made of Elohim to us, said apartness, that no flesh might esteem in his sight, but that he, or but that he boasts, sorry, but that he that boasts might boast in Yahuwah, unquote. And hence all the great things promised in the covenant of favor Yehezkiel or Ezekiel 36, 25, 26, and 27. Among the rest, his putting his ruach within them and causing them to walk in his statutes are said to be done for his set-apart name's sake. Verse 22. 7. Wherefore will he carry on the good work, which he has begun and never utterly leave his people? nor suffer them altogether to depart from him. Why? It is even for his name's sake and his promise's sake. Yeremiah 32, 40. Quote, I will make an everlasting covenant with them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their heart and they shall not depart from me. Unquote. Hebrews 13, 5. Quote, I will never leave you nor forsake you finally. Unquote. 8. Wherefore does his esteem last? Or wherefore does his esteem at last? It is for his name's sake, who is the giver both of favor and esteem. Psalm 84 11. It is your father's told pleasure to give you the kingdom. Quote, the gift of Elohim is eternal life through Mashiach Yahushua, our Yahuwah, unquote. Thus every part of deliverance from first to last is wrought for his name's sake. 
quote, Yahuwah is a rock and his work is perfect, unquote. He begins for his name's sake and carries on for his name's sake and completes the work for his name's sake. That the headstone of deliverance may be laid on the shoutings of favor, favor unto it. And that's also scripture. It's in the Psalms. As all the parts of deliverance, so all the means of deliverance are granted for his name's sake. And this is why it says that he is the all in all of our deliverance, right? Because everything is done for his sake, for his name's sake, for his character. Because he is who he is. Deliverance is the way it is. He says, is right hearing a means of deliverance? Well, this is what he gives for his name's sake, according to that promise, Yahuchanan 10.16, quote, Other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, unquote. Is prayer a means? Well, right praying is what he alone grants for his name's sake, according to the promise. Zakar Yahu, <clears throat> twelve ten, quote, I will pour out a ruach of favor and supplication, unquote. And Shaul mentions that the ruach pleads in our, in with utterings unmentionable when we don't know what to pray, he petitions on our behalf, or she, if you will, the ruach petitions on our behalf. Is steadfast fidelity a means of deliverance? Yea, and it is a part of deliverance also which El gives for his name's sake. According to his word, Ephesians 2.8, quote, By favor you are delivered through Amuna, or belief, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of Elohim, unquote. Is repentance a leading part of deliverance? This is also what he gives for his name's sake, on the back of Amuna, belief, as a fruit thereof, according to his promise, Zakar Yahu 10.12, quote, They shall look on him whom they have pierced and mourn, unquote. And he has exalted Mashiach to give it, Acts 5.31. My friends, if there be any other thing that we reckon pertain to deliverance, which Elohim does not work for his name's sake, you may realize that, or you may realize it as no part of deliverance. For I will assure you, his name will have the esteem of every part of deliverance. Four. The fourth thing proposed was what is imported in this nevertheless, or in El's delivering with a notwithstanding, and so to show over what impediments, whether real provocations or seeming impossibilities of bringing about this deliverance, for his name's sake, quote, nevertheless, he delivered them for his name's sake, unquote. It is impediments on the sinner's part that the text speaks of. Therefore, I confine myself to these. He delivered Yisrael here, notwithstanding dreadful sins. Read Psalm 106, verses 6, 7, 13, 14, 16, 19, 20, 21, 24, 25, 28, 29, 32, 34, 39, and 43. Yet, quote, nevertheless, he delivered them for his name's sake, unquote. Did he notwithstanding all this deliver them for his name's sake? Then what will he not do for his name? And what may not sinners expect upon this ground? What bar cannot Elohim break for his name's sake? What mountain cannot be overcome for his name's sake? 
What provocation can he not overlook for his name's sake? Now, you can answer these questions with Scripture. There's only one unforgivable sin that he mentions. It's blaspheming the, the works of the Ruach by attributing it to Satan. What the Pharisees were doing by saying that the works that he did, he did by Baal Zebul, right? Which translates into the Lord of the Flies. <clears throat> Let all the sinners that hear this doctrine beware of provoking Elohim any more by their sins, when thus the delivering loving kindness of El is proclaimed in your ears. For provoked loving kindness will turn to fearful vengeance. Damnation to eternity will be your doom, if this offered deliverance be not received. And in order to allure you to the reception and welcoming of it, I am now telling you the freedom of it and how El can deliver you with an everlasting deliverance, notwithstanding of the most grievous provocations that hitherto you have been guilty of and notwithstanding of the greatest impediments that you have laid in the way. More particularly, one... He can deliver for his name's sake, notwithstanding grievous guilt and heinous transgressions. Hence, his name is declared to be an L pardoning inequity, transgression, and sin. Quote, Come now and let us reason together, unquote, says Yahuwah, Yeshayahu 1.18. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Make not this objection against yourselves in coming to Elohim in Mashiach for deliverance. For here you see loving kindness courting you, notwithstanding that this very objection. 2. He can deliver for his name's sake, notwithstanding long continuance in sin. Though you have been a transgressor from the womb to this day, be it never so long that you have been following that fearful trait of sin, yet loving kindness is now following you with a, quote, how long, how long, unquote. How, or many a how long is he pursuing you with? One is Numbers 14, 11, quote, how long will this tribe provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? Unquote. Another how long is Psalm 4 2. Quote, how long will you turn my esteem into shame? How long will you love vanity? Unquote. Another how long, Proverbs 1 22. Quote, how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? Unquote. Another is Proverbs 6.92, quote, How long will you sleep sluggard? When will you arise out of your sleep? Unquote. A sixth how long, Yeremiyahu 4, 1 and 4, or 1, 14 rather, quote, How long shall your vain thoughts lodge within you? Unquote. Number three, he can deliver for his name's sake, notwithstanding manifold apostasies and backslidings. Yeremiyahu 4.14 Yarushalayim, wash your heart from inequity, that you may be delivered. How long shall vain thoughts lodge within you? Turn backsliding children, says Yahuwah. For I am married unto you, unquote. Yeremiyahu 3.14. I'm sorry that I have that quote twice, but this one says three, so we'll have to look and make sure which one's accurate. And verse one, quote, Though you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me again, unquote. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. 
and let him return unto Yahuwah, for he will have loving kindness upon him, and to our El, for he will abundantly pardon. Hosea 14.4, quote, I will heal your backslidings, unquote. Number four, he can deliver for his name's sake, notwithstanding of your prodigious neglect and contempt of Elohim hitherto. See Yeshayahu 43, 22 through 25. Quote, but you have not called upon me, Yaakov, but you have been weary of me, Yisrael. I, even I, am he that blots out your transgressions for my name's sake and will not remember your sins, unquote. O wonder of wonders. And just for the record, he wrote this in 1720 or 1730. He was not aware of our creator's name at that time. It was actually during the time of the culmination or the fulfillment of the second woe, where his great name or the refuge was being lost. It started with the making of the Wycliffe translation in 1390, and it culminated with the earthquake of Yarushalayim in 1834. And through the process of the events of that time, his name was taken out of the earth. Uh, there's a lot more detail to that, and you can look at the Antichrist or anti mashiach for, vid vid for Dummies videos. And we have some stuff about Gad the Seer that goes along with that, with the three woes. But it all ties together. And you can even see, though he did not have his real name in truth, he was using titles. He did call on Jehovah. He wrote that in the text here as best he knew, but he even used the wrong titles and the wrong title for the Elohim. Not because he was trying to sin, but because that was literally written and they were confused on the matter. It wasn't until later that things became known about the tampering and deception. But they were walking in the truth that they knew. And even here, even with that deception and prevalent, this is what he knew about the name just derived from what was written. We don't have an excuse for that. We know who his name is in truth. We know that there's power in his name. Even when it was being, even when people were calling on the wrong name, there was power in it when they believed and they were walking right. That is his great favor. It wasn't always, but you can look throughout scripture. Everyone who calls on the name of Yahuwah shall be delivered. That's unequivocal. There is a difference. So the distinction here is important and ob willing. Believers will start to get that in their minds. He says that such may be delivered for his name's sake. Number five. He can deliver for his name's sake, notwithstanding grievous, rebellious, incrobleness, <laughs> and frowardness. I'm sorry about that. This is being incur incorrigible is not being able to be peaceable with anybody. Frowardness, you go to or fro, right? Fro is to be contrary. These are just rather synonyms, but different, okay? However, we've been this way towards him, especially believers now, since at least the fake moon missions of the 1960s, taking prayer out of schools, allowing the murder of children with abortion. These things are grievous rebellions against the covenant we've made with our almighty creator. We, we can repent, but we actually have to. That This is what this is getting at. And it's for his namesake alone that these things are so. There's actually a mention of this very thing. And for that very reason of his delivering us, just as he did the fathers, our forefathers of old, um, mentioned in the exhortation of the Damascus, Damascus document of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But to continue, it says, See Yeshiyahu 57, 17, and 18. Quote, For the inequity of his covetedness I was wroth and smote him. I hid me 
and was wroth, and he went on frowardly in the way of his heart. So he hid the truth. He hid comprehension. He hid hokma. He hid mightiness and power. Right? These are all what he qualifies as me in Proverbs verse 8 or chapter 8. But I hid me and was wroth, and he went on frowardly in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. Unquote. Six. He can deliver for his name's sake, notwithstanding outward afflictions and poor circumstances in the world. Zephin Yahu 312. And quote, I will also leave in the midst of you an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of Yahuwah. Unquote. Yeshiyahu 26 8. Quote, Yea, in the way of your judgments, Yahuwah, you have or have we waited for you. The desire of our nephesh or inner being is to your name and to the remembrance of you. And that goes back to Shemot or Exodus, where he says, Yahuwah is his Shem Zakar or his remembrance, his remembrance memorial name, if you will. Though you be an outcast that nobody cares for you, he may deliver you for his name's sake, for, quote, he gathers the outcasts of Yisrael, unquote. Yeshiyahu 56, 8. 7. He can deliver for his name's sake, notwithstanding baseness, unworthiness, and pollution, for there is a fountain opened. Zakar Yahu 13 12. Quote, In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of beloved or Dawid and to the inhabitants of Yarushalayim for sin and for uncleanness. Unquote. And you see, this is what he's doing. He's establishing foundational facts that you can ask for and pray about in belief because it's law. His word is what we are to live by, every word that proceeds from the mouth of Yahuwah, which the men of Elohim spoke, moved by the Ruach, his words. So you have to keep these things in mind when you're reading Hok Shalomo. Those are the words of Mashiach, just the same as Shemot is, just the same as Yob, just the same as any of the epistles. This is what he chose to speak through the Ruach, through other men, just as he is the voice of the Father. Okay, as he sees and does, or as he sees and hears, so he says and does. Number eight, he can deliver for his name's sake, notwithstanding gross darkness and fearful ignorance. Quote, it is written in the foretellers, they shall all be taught of Yahuwah, unquote. Yeshiyahu 54, 13, Yahu Hanan 6, 45. 9. He can deliver for his name's sake, notwithstanding long refusals and resisting of many callings and slighting many opportunities. Romans 10, 21. Quote, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people, unquote. Importing that after all these refusals, he is yet standing with open arms to receive all comers, saying, quote, whoever will, let him come, unquote. Quote, or ten, sorry. He can deliver for his name's sake, notwithstanding of none such and unparalleled wickedness. What, if there be no sinner like you, nevertheless he can deliver for his name's sake, because there is no deliverer like him. If your unbelieving heart suggests desperate thoughts, as if there 
were no deliverance for you, saying, Who is a sinner like unto me? Let Micah 7.18 be an answer. Quote, Who is an L like unto you, pardoning inequity? Unquote. In a word, he can deliver for his name's sake, notwithstanding the greatest and highest mountains either of sin or misery, and that seem to be in the way. Zechariah 4 7. Quote, who, are, who are you, great mountain? Before our Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. Unquote. He can deliver for his name's sake, notwithstanding dreadful hardness of heart and innumerable plagues of heart, atheism, unbelief, deadness, and security. The Elohim that works for his name's sake can take away the heart of stone and give the heart of flesh, and out of stones raise up children to Abraham. He can deliver for his name's sake, notwithstanding of nameless maladies, nameless objections that no minister in the world can mention, far less remove. Maybe the obstacles in the way of your deliverance are out of the sight of man, out of the sight of ministers, but they are in Yahuwah's sight, and the omniscient El, meaning the all-knowing, right? L that knows it is the omnipotent L, all powerful, that can remove it and deliver his name or and deliver for his name's sake. Oh, but may some poor soul think, do doubt he can deliver for his name's sake, but my objection is I doubt of his will. Why, man? Wherefore is Elohim now telling you what he can do, but to remove your ill thoughts of him, and to manifest his good will towards you? Behold, he is more willing to deliver you than you are willing to be delivered, if it be deliverance from sin, as well as deliverance from hell, or Gehenna, that you mean then you are either unwilling to be thus delivered, and so your ruin is that you will not come to him for deliverance. Or, if you be willing, you are more than welcome to him for all the deliverance he can work for you. It is his will to deliver you, notwithstanding the thousands and millions of objections in between you and the way. 5. The fifth thing proposed in the general method was to offer some reasons why he thus delivers for his name's sake. Why? 1. He delivers for his name's sake because if he did not so, he would deliver none of Adam's race. The best set-apart ones on earth cannot deserve loving kindness. The deliverance of the most righteous is an act of favor. Therefore, the righteous run to his name, and even the righteous must live by steadfast fidelity, saying, quote, Though our inequities testify against us, yet do you it for your name's sake. Unquote. Yirmiyahu 14.7 And, quote, Help us for the esteem of your name, unquote. Psalm 79, 9. He can deliver none if he did not deliver them for his name's sake. 2. He delivers for his name's sake that sinners may hope or expect in his name, that they may return to him and call upon him for loving kindness. Quote, there is loving kindness and forgiveness with him that he may be feared. Unquote. Psalm 134. Why, say you, could not Eloah be more feared if he had no loving kindness and forgiveness with him? 
it is true man in that case could fear as devils do despairingly but not with any pentiential fear which means that you'll turn from your evil quote the tovim of elohim leads to repentance unquote romans 4 2 thus elohim interprets his loving and kind providences as drawing with the cords of love none could trust in his name if he did not deliver for his name's sake three he delivers for his name's sake that sinners may adore his name that they may admire his loving kindness elohim remembers his own esteem and therefore delivers for his name's sake that men may esteem his name O oh, wonder-working L, that can show loving-kindness when nothing is deserved but misery. This effect it had upon Dawid, Psalm 8, 1, and 9. Quote, Yahuwah our master, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Unquote. Psalm 48, 10. Quote, According to your name, L, so is your praise unto the ends of the earth. Unquote. 4. He delivers for his name's sake that sinners who will not flee to his name as a strong tower and afterwards esteem his name by living to his praise may be left inexcusable in their sins. The esteem of El's right righteousness or justice will be conspicuous in those that have slighted his loving kindness. Quote, Behold, you despisers, and wonder and perish. Unquote. Acts 13.41 And that's also in the Psalms. Or uh, it might be in one of the foretellers. I'm sorry, I'll have to look that up and get the other quote. They that despise such loving kindness treasure up to themselves wrath against the day of wrath romans 2 5 number five he delivers for his name's sake because it is the only fit way for us to be delivered in if eloah should offer to deliver us for our own sakes for our righteousness sake for our duty's sake oh how unfit would that be we might think Elohim were mocking us because we have nothing but sin and Gehenna or hell about us, and our best righteousness deserves damnation. But when he offers deliverance for his own name's sake, then it appears to be a fit offer. We cannot think El is mocking us. Would he thus affront himself when his own name is the ground of steadfast fidelity, Amuna or belief laid up before us. Six. He delivers for his name's sake because it is the only fit way for him to deliver us in. It is the only way of deliverance suitable to his infinite excellency, who cannot but consult the esteem of his perfections in all his works. Now, El's esteem requires that no deliverance should be found but in his name why has he told us of his loving or of loving kindness running in the channel of the new covenant why has he told us that right ruling justice itself is drawn in to be upon the sinner's side inasmuch as he can be declared right in forgiving them why has he displayed so much hokmah or of Hokma in making judgment and loving kindness to kiss each other. Hokma in punishing sin and yet delivering the sinner. Why? It is even that he might be esteemed, that the pride of man might be brought down, and the haughtiness of man made low or laid low, and that Yahuwah alone may be exalted. Yes, Yahoo two eleven. This way of delivering is suitable to his nature. Six. 
The sixth thing proposed was to draw some inferences from the whole. And it is so that when Eloah delivers sinners or a sinful nation, he does it for his name's sake, notwithstanding their provocations, whereby they forfeit his help and deserve destruction. Then, and then I also put, you want to read Gad chapter 7. First, hence learn by way of caution the following particulars. One, that this doctrine yields no encouragement to sin. Though Eloah delivers sinners for his name's sake, the current of his providence, the current of his word, the current of his dealing all declare his enmity at sin. What is there in the word that can encourage us in sin? All the threatenings of the law say in effect, as you regard the wrath of Elohim, beware of sin. All the commands of the Torah say, as you regard the authority of El, beware of sin. All the promises of the good news say, as you regard the favor, love, and loving kindness of Elohim, beware of sin. And El's delivering for his name's sake says, as you regard the great name of El, beware of sin. And another one that he might not have been aware of, is in the Shepherd of Hermas, book 2, the commands, the first commandment is to believe that Elohim is one, that he himself contains all things and is not contained by anything. And believing in him, fear him, and fearing him, turn away from all evil. And if you do that and keep that command, you will live unto Elohim. And you'll be able to keep all the commandments. It says, the great deliverance that he exhibits for his name's sake is deliverance from sin. And therefore, to make this an encouragement to sin is to affront his name, to abuse his name, to profane his name, and to take his name in vain, or to lift up, bear, and carry to Nasa, eth the Shem of Yahuwah, to a lie. Falsehood, fabrication, not ruin or vanity. Quote, and he will not hold them guiltless that take his name in vain. It literally says he will not cleanse the one or he will not purify the one who lifts up eth his shem to a not a lie, ruin, falsehood, vanity. And if you read the book of Gad, Chapter 1, in there he mentions that though the pure and the unpure are both the work of his hands, there is a distinction between them, and it is the pure that has a place with him, not the impure. Here is a direct reference of what he will not purify, and you can look that up in the Hebrew. He will not purify the one who lifts up his name to a lie. <clears throat> Number two, think not that El will deliver any from eternal damnation who are going to hell or Gehenna or deliver them for his name's sake. No, by no means they are lost forever that die out of Mashiach. Secondly, hence see by way of information a foundation for the following truths. One, the reason why the set-apart ones confide in Eloah and why believers trust in his name and flee to his name in time of danger, they are acquainted with his name, quote, and they that know his name will put their trust in him, unquote. Psalm 9.10 They know his favor, his tovim, his power, his kodeshah, his right ruling, and truth. And they have the encouragement of the promise so to do. Psalm 91, 14, quote, I will set him on high because he has known my name, unquote. 
and why is it that they pray for help, for his name's sake? Because they know El will do more for his name than otherwise he could do. Psalm 25.11, Yirmiyahu 14.7 Thus Yahushua, when Yisrael was smitten at Ai, chapter 7, verse 9 of Yahushua, the book, quote, And what will you do unto your great name? Unquote. Again, two. Hence see to whom we ought to give the esteem of experienced loving kindness, even to El's name, as Psalm 115.1, quote, Not unto us, not unto us, but to your name be the esteem, for your loving kindness and for your truth's sake, unquote. Thus you will find Dawid frequently at this work, Psalm 145, 1 and 2, quote, I will extol you, my Elohim, O King, and I will barak your name, Le'olam wa'ed, or literally for ages and witnessed. Every yom I will barak you, and I will praise your Shem, Le'olam wa'ed, unquote. This is one ground of hel El helping. Yeshiyahu 29, 22, and 23, and Gad chapter 7. This is, in a manner, all that Yahuwah gets by all his esteemed deliverances wrought for us. Yehezkiel 36, 23. Let us therefore learn to render the esteem of all El's works unto his esteemed name. 3. Hence see a door of expectation opened for sinners in this Besora. Does Elohim deliver for his name's sake these who may not put in for deliverance? Whatever they be, whatever objections you can make, they are answered by this one argument. El delivers for his name's sake. When there is no other reason for his doing so in the world, he can make a reason to himself and find the answer in himself why he will deliver. 4. Hence the freeness of the good news method of deliverance. For Eloah delivers with a non-obstinate, that is, with a notwithstanding. Oh, but the Basora deliverance is free. The law brings in so many provisios, that is, either the law of works truly so called. It says, if you do, you shall live. If you be perfect, you shall be happy. Or the law falsely so called. And you see, this is an inconsistent this is and just like what Shaul says, the Torah that came in, it's not it's not incongruent with the promises, but it was added because of transgression. Now, if you do, you shall live. That's established law. It's written, it's confirmed, and that's actually you can prove it. Hanok did. He lived according to the will of his maker as it was made known to him, and he was taken to paradise forever. He has not tasted death. Eliyahu lives. He was taken up in a chariot of fire. It was mentioned specifically in the animal apocalypse for Eliyahu that he was brought to where Hanok was. And so I'm not, I'm not just making these things up out of my own cognition. It's literally written. You just have to piece these things together. Another fact of that Fourth or second Baruch, Baruch is told by Yahuwah that he's going to be taken until the consummations of the time standing before him because of his disposition and how he mourned for Zion. And for in, in fourth Ezra, Ezra was told that it was for him and those like him to be taken to paradise and to not suffer things because they choose of their own volition to love the truth that's given to them and be obedient to him perfectly. All right. 
everyone that's going to be delivered when our Mashiach returns in the flesh, when his when he comes and they're called up to him and they're changed into messengers, every single one of them without exception will have to have the same disposition as the men who are also kept without dying because he's not partial. He does not play favorites. He does not lower his expectations. He has a standard. But I, I'm just trying to point out, if you sin, he forgives you. If you come to him, he will he will deliver you. If you live perfectly before him, he will keep you from harm. This is also witnessed in the fourth vision of the shepherd of Hermas. In book one, the visions where the persecution and the tribulation that was soon to come upon the assembly that he was seeing, he was specifically told that those that had perfect belief and obedience, those that trusted in Yahuwah would be delivered from the wrath to come and would walk right by it. And all they would do is be able to wag their tongue. So not everyone had that disposition. Some had other problems. Okay. I'm not trying to say that everybody will always be delivered or taken from wrath. There's different things for why things happen. Anyone who's committed an inequity has to be corrected for it, either in this life or in the age to come. Anyone who's done um, something that deserves death, you, you have to pay the price for it. This is why he says you count the cost of what it's going to make to build the tower before you start. You have to cogni be cognizant of what you've done in your life and be willing and acknowledge that there will be reformation for the inequities that you've committed. All right. And then you can trust in him and you can rejoice in your suffering because you're not being treated as illegitimate, but as a true child of the almighty. Here you go. Sorry about that. I had to stop for a moment because it wasn't scrolling, but we're going to go ahead and continue again. It says, secondly, hence see by way of information a foundation for the following truths. One, the reason why the Kodeshim confide in Aloha and why believers trust in his name and flee to his name in time of danger. They are acquainted with his name. Quote, and that they may or that they know his name will put their trust in him. I'm sorry, let me try it again. Quote, and they that know his name will put their trust in him. Unquote. That's Psalm 9 10. They know his favor, his Tobim, his power, his Kodeshah, his right ruling and truth. And they have the encouragement of a promise so to do. Psalm 91, 14. Quote, I will set him on high because he has known my name. Unquote. And why is it that they pray for help for his name's sake? Because they know El will do more for his name than otherwise he could do. Psalm 25, 11. Yirmiyahu 14, 7. Thus, Yahushua, when Yisrael were smitten at I, chapter 7, verse 9, quote, And what will you do unto your great name? Unquote. Again, two, hence see to whom we ought to give the esteem of experienced loving kindness, even to El's name, as Psalm 115, 1, quote, Not unto us, not unto us, but to your name be the esteem, for your loving kindness and for your truth's sake. Unquote. Thus you will find Dawid frequently at this work, Psalm 145, 1 and 2. Quote, I will extol you, my Elohim, King, and I will barak your Shem, Le'olam Wa'ed. Every yom or day I will barak you, and I will praise your name, unto ages and witnessed right leolam wa'ed and i'm i'm sorry i've already read this part but like i said i i lost track of where i was when it wasn't scrolling uh but we're going to continue we're almost caught up it says 
This is one ground of El helping. Yes, Yahoo 29, 22, and 23. And before I forget, I was reminded while we were reading through the fact that he will deliver sinners notwithstanding their provocations and their rebellions and the evil th that they're doing. There is an excellent example of that very thing that is not written in scripture, but was carried down uh, through different means to us today. And I will find that after this and we'll share it with you so you can see his benevolent loving kindness in forgiving sinners, notwithstanding their provocation. This is in a manner all that Yahuwah gets by all his esteemed deliverances wrought for us. Yehez Yahu or Ezekiel 36, 23. Let us therefore learn to render the esteem of El or the esteem of all El's works unto his esteemed name. Three. Hence see a door of hope opened for sinners in this Basora. Does Elohim deliver for his name's sake these who may not put in for deliverance? Whatever they be, whatever objections you can make, they are answered by this one argument. El delivers for his name's sake. When there is no other reason for his doing so in the world, he can make a reason to himself and find the answer in himself why he will deliver. 4. Hence see the freshness of the Basora method of deliverance, or the freeness, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not freshness. For Eloah delivers with a non-obstinate, that is, with a notwithstanding. But the Basora deliverance is free. The law brings in so many provisios. That is, either the law of works, truly so called. It says, if you do, you shall live. If you be perfect, you shall be happy. Or the law, falsely so called. The many reminders of it in man's heart that makes the sinner think, why I cannot be delivered unless I do as well as I can, unless I be so and so qualified. I cannot expect to be delivered, but the Basora opens a door of free access to sinners with a, nevertheless, notwithstanding whatever sins, guilt, disorder, confusion, death, distress, and ruin, notwithstanding whatsoever wickedness be about you, yet here is a way wherein you may expect deliverance. Quote, Nevertheless, he delivered them for his name's sake, unquote. And he already made the provision that that doesn't mean that this is a license or permission to sin because everything in the word is against it. But this is to give anyone who, soever they, they might be, however so far gone they might think they are, they have expectation in him if they will only believe and turn to him. Objection. Must I not be delivered upon my believing and repenting? Is not Amuna, steadfast fidelity, belief, at least the condition of my deliverance? Answer. Amuna and repentance are parts of this deliverance that Elohim gives for his name's sake. And how can they be conditions of that deliverance whereof they are leading parts? And... It, it says explicitly in the apostolic constitutions under the gifts of the Ruach that belief is a gift. Even being a believer, having belief in Elohim is a gift of his Ruach to you, and it's not of yourself. So we can't take credit for anything of this. It's to be humble. We can be humbly accepting of it or not. But that's the only options that we have. Quote, by favor you are delivered through Amuna, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of Elohim. Unquote. Ephesians 2.8 Mashiach is exalted to give repentance. 
Acts 5.51 None are delivered without steadfast fidelity and repentance, because all that are delivered of Yahuwah are delivered thereunto. They are delivered from unbelief and brought to Amuna, delivered from impenitency and brought to repentance. Amuna and repentance are the beginnings of this deliverance. And deliverance I cannot, sorry, and deliverance cannot be completed without having a beginning. But both beginning and end are what El gives for his name's sake. Quote, Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Mashiach. Unquote. Philippians 1.6 Because his name is Aleph and Tau, the beginning and the ending. Amuna itself is not necessary to deliverance as a moral condition, but only a physical instrument, and hence as it is not possible a beggar can be the better of a free gift offered to him if he does not take it or accept of it. Yet his taking of it is no moral condition, but only the natural instrument or means of possession. So neither can any possibly be the better of this free deliverance that Elohim offers in the good news if they will not take it or have it in the manner it is offered, namely deliverance from sin and wrath unto eternal kodeshah or set-apartness and happiness and all freely for Yahuwah's name's sake. And it mentions in the Apostolic Constitutions as well that only, only a believer taking hold of the truth in, in truth, doing what he knows is right, and is, he can take hold of the expectation of the joy of that which is to come, meaning he is in truth living in the way his creator wills, and he knows that the expectation of eternal, unspeakable good things belong to him. When that, when that truth manifests in your mind, and you know it is a fact, the joy that it unlocks in your being is inexpressible. You can't, you can't contain it, and it's not something that you can fake or continue in if it's not true in your life. This is what is mentioned there. Taking is no moral condition, otherwise it would contradict the design of the good news. Amuna is nothing else but a welcoming this deliverance in this manner. It is the inner beings acquiescing and falling in with this method, not a condition of it properly, but a closing with it freely. It is a believing that El will deliver in this way for his name's sake, and not for the sake of our steadfast fidelity, or our belief, or our trustworthiness, or anything else done by or wrought in us. It is a being content to be delivered this way, that the name of Yahuwah may forever get the praise, and renouncing all other grounds of belief and reasons of expectation, taking this name of Yahuwah for his strong tower, resolving to rest here. 5. Hence see what is the last and ultimate refuge of belief or Amuna. The first resort of Amuna is to a word, a, quote, maybe Yahuwah will be favorable, unquote. But a finding no rest here, then perhaps it goes to a direct promise such as that, quote, a new heart will I give you, unquote, and pleads for the promise's sake. But needing to be better fixed, it goes to Mashiach and pleads for Mashiach's sake, in whom all the promises are yea and amen. Yet why should Eloah deliver for Mashiach's sake? What obligation is Elohim under to accept of that ransom and atonement in the blood of Mashiach for me? Why? Then last of all, it flees to El's name, 
and sees that Yahuwah's name will be more magnified in this deliverance or in this way of deliverance than it can be in any other way of El's dealing with it. And hence it is never said he damns for his name's sake. For his name gets no such or gets not so much esteem that way. Here then is the last shift of belief, and its ultimate refuge and ground of expectation is there, or and there is ground enough here. <clears throat> use three. The next use shall be for examination. Try whether or not Yahuwah has begun to deliver you for his name's sake. Or, if you have got his name engaged in and concerned in your deliverance work. And I haven't finished editing it here, I'm sorry. For the trial of this interesting point, consider the following things. One. They whom El has begun to deliver for his name's sake, and to whom he will be further merciful or lovingly kind for his name's sake, they are made sensible that Elohim has hitherto helped them for his name's sake, and that they are beholden to Yahuwah's name for every bit of bread, indebted to his name for their preservation out of Gehenna obligated to his loving kindness or his unmerited tender loving kindness and power that hitherto he has helped pitied and delivered them from everlasting ruin and they are so affected with his unmerited tender loving kindness that they endeavor to live like men sensible of this obligation they are under to his name though in strict right ruling they deserve nothing and Elohim may say, as Judges 10, 13, quote, I will deliver no one, or I will deliver you no more, unquote. And swear, as Yeremiah 44, 26, 27, quote, Behold, I have sworn by my great name, said Yahuwah, that my name shall be no more named in the mouth of any man, unquote. And it mentions in another place that because of the way that we are doing things, the evils that we did, uh, if we had not done them, his name would not have been wiped out from before him, right? So these things are alluded to throughout scripture. The fact that he, his name would be taken is the second woe of revelation as revealed in Gad the seer. And it's mentioned elsewhere and alluded to by foretellers and in actuality in the actual events of things, both pre-antediluvian, pre-flood, and in the course of time, right? The children went astray. They lost things. They lost the feast, lost his names, and then they return it. And that was a type and shadow of what would come later on during the Dark Ages. Uh, there's a lot more involved with those things that we'll get into as we go along. But let's continue. We'll finish this up. It says, yet being a favorable Elohim will not utterly leave them. First Shemuel 12.22 But deliver them and others for their sake, so Tob is he to them. Bereshit or Genesis 18.32 Number two. Has frowning providence done you good? Are you purged by afflictions? For these whom Eloah delivers for his name's sake, their deliverance from trouble bears some resemblance to his name who delivers. Question. How shall we know when El's rid, or sorry, when Elohim's when Elohim has done his or has done its work, and when El has said, quote, it is enough, unquote, 2 Shemuel 24, 16. And if you're not familiar, the same thing with Gad this year, chapter 7, I believe. But um, the it is enough 
was what he had said when he stopped the messenger from plaguing and it, when it was plaguing Yarushalayim after the children had gone and done what was displeasing in his sight and they had boasted that they would be like the other nations. He and this is what you see in Shemuel Chronicles in Gad the Seer. They all have the account of the numbering of the children by Dawid, and they all have different renditions of it, so you can get a fuller context of what was going on. But because of what the children were doing and saying, Yahuwah allowed the adversary or Satan to mislead Dawid into numbering the children because of what was written in Shemuel chapters 5 through 12 about when they asked for a sovereign over them. If they would do right, then both they and their sovereigns would be all right. And if they went apostate, both they and their sovereigns would be consumed. So that very thing that's established with a king over the people is how every household and with a man over his house functions. You can see that more clearly throughout the course of reading the books, the three books of the Shepherd of Hermas. But to continue here, it says, answer, when you are humbled for the sin that caused Eloah to take his rod in his hand, such as want of love, despising the good news, abounding of error, division, unbrotherly animosities. Have these things been lamented, loathing the simplicity of the good news and the plain administration of L's ordinances? Professors groan when full in their stomach. Is the case altered? The abounding hypocrisy under the spacious name of higher attainments and etc. And this is all talking about things... Are you going to be forgiven if you don't repent of the things you're doing? You're going to be corrected for the stuff, and that's how you know when you're loved. But if you're full and you're not realizing that these things are happening, if you take in the word and you're you're receiving these things, but you don't cognize, you don't realize, you don't take into mind what's going on in your life, it doesn't help you. I can't speak for everyone here, but I personally have had affliction, hardship, and trouble for the things I've chose to do. I was corrected for them, especially when I came to him. I've suffered, and it it's something that he's allowed me to know why it was certain things happen, both personally for my own self and for for things I've personally witnessed and even our group here is familiar with in a physical firsthand knowledge. Things can happen to you when you're not doing according to his will. And repentance and true humility in that will bring healing and deliverance. And sometimes of things that are what you call miraculous and not able to be explained medically. This is number two. When a nation can thrive under merciful providences without the rod... For El will not needlessly afflict any, much less his own nation. Verse Kepha 1 6 and Lamentations 3 33. And it says all over the place that he will not punish the, the innocent with the guilty. He does not, he does not suffer the righteous to, to be afflicted in that capacity. There someone might mention what about the martyrs and things of that nature. These are also explained in the Shepherd of Hermas, but this is what I meant by counting the costs. The nations were given deliverance, and everyone that came to him was forgiven, but they're not left unpunished for their inequities. Anyone who'd ever been in the mysteries had murdered people in witchcraft. They can repent and come to him, but their, their life will be forfeit because they've taken the life of man, and his law has... Anyone who draws man's blood by man, their, their blood shall be drawn. That's foundational from the beginning. You can't change that. He will forgive you eternally, bring you to him, but there's consequences for the actions that we've done. This is what I mean by you have to count the cost of the building of the tower for coming to belief, but the cost of not doing so is greater. You might suffer. You might know that you're going to die. You might be afflicted and suffer punishments, much like Shaul. Look at what he did to the assemblies 
And you can see even more when you read the recognitions of Clement, what happened with Yaakov, what happened with the assembly and all the believers in the Yahudim there. And then you look at what Shaul chose to do in his life. After he repented, he was forgiven. He was shown great miraculous things and he became a, a mighty evangelist or emissary for our for the truth. But he was not left unpunished. He suffered horrendously. He was persecuted. He was beaten. He was stoned, shipwrecked. There were things that happened to him because of the things that he had done. It, it cannot be otherwise. This is what he was talking about by the messenger whose name, the father's name is in our Mashiach. He will not leave them unpunished for their inequities. Not that he won't forgive them eternally, but he can't leave them uncorrected. Period. Of willing that that starts to make more sense. This is more particularly, one, are your deliverance and Elohim's esteem twisted and conjoined? Will El's name be a loser if your bonds be strengthened and continued? Yahushua said, quote, what will you do unto your name, unquote. This moved Elohim to show unmerited tender loving kindness on a wicked nation. Deuteronomy 33, 26, 27. Least Elohim should lose his declarative esteem in the wonders he had wrought for Yisrael. Least the heathen should say, El cannot deliver his people. Can you say, Oh, I think Eloa will want much esteem if I be not delivered. And I cannot think that his name should want that esteem and praise that I will give it in delivering me. 2. They whom he delivers for his name's sake are removed from any expectation of being delivered for their own sake. As Elohim says, quote, Not for your sakes have I done this, but for my own name's sake. Unquote. So they are brought to say, not for my sake will Elohim do so and so, but for his name's sake. 3. They seek all the want from Elohim, or they seek all they want from Elohim for his name's sake. Many a favorless beggar seeks for alms from for El's sake. That Know not what they say, but believers are beggars at Yahuwah's door, and they seek for Yahuwah's sake. They seek pardon for his name's sake with Dawid, quote, For your name's sake, pardon my inequity, for it is great, unquote. And that's another example we'll get to as we read through the scriptures again. But if you're familiar, Dawid is a living example of that being forgiven for inequity, but by no means left unpunished. In that he committed adultery with Bath, with Bath Shiva, right? And had her husband murdered through war so that he could marry her and not have illegitimate or any problems. And because of what he did, while he asked forgiveness and he repented of it, he acknowledged his sin and, and, and sought his the favor of the Almighty. He was forgiven, but the words of his mouth came upon him, his fears came upon him, and he he had what he said in judgment is what happened to him about the conditions of what went on. And while he took one, he lost four, and the sword never left his house because of it. In unless and except for when they are obedient to the truth. Thus they lean upon his lap and give evidence of their being loved with an everlasting love. Number four, they will desire to do much for his name's sake and will be content to suffer for his name's sake. Such is the regard to his name that every duty they perform will be easy to them. When they have his name and honor in their eye, and they count their sufferings all to be light when they suffer for his name. This made them take joyfully the spoiling of their goods. 
Hebrews 10, 34. 5. They will set his name on high, as being a name above every name. Hence they will desire and endeavor to have his name exalted in the world, that all men may know his name. They will be grieved when his name is profaned and blasphemed. They will be content that their name sink and be buried, that his name that his may arise, saying, Let me decrease and him increase. Whatever may come of my name, let your name be exalted. Their ambition will be to have his name written in their foreheads. Quote, I will write upon them my new name. Unquote. Revelation 3.12 6. They approve and esteem the way of deliverance for this reason, because Elohim delivers for his name's sake. Their hearts say, I prize deliverance the better, that his name is honored thereby. They set his name above their deliverance as a crown of it, or as the crown of it and his name below their deliverance as the ground of it. And his name and attributes round about their deliverance as the defense of it, the place of their defense being the munition of rocks, and the rock being the truth upon which we tread, right? The foundation upon which we stand. Or like the rock badger who seeks his shelter, in the crags. His name is a rock round about them. Quote, As the mountains are about Yerushalayim, so Yahuwah is round about his people, from henceforth even forever. Unquote. And that's Psalm 125. As that is his reason for delivering them, even his name, so it is the reason for expecting deliverance. As Yahuwah's argument in saving them or delivering them is drawn from his name, so their argument in trusting in him for deliverance is drawn from his name. Oh, but this is what sweetens the thoughts of deliverance, that his name is exalted thereby. They desire no other way of deliverance but through his name. 7. And this is, again, something that's made emphatically clear in the Shepherd of Hermas, where the multiple parables are in connection with the building of his assembly, the removing of <clears throat> the faults in his children, the plank in the eye, if you will. And one of the things that he makes clear is that all believers have to be carried through the gate, which is our Mashiach, by the virgins. And the virgins are the different names of the characteristics of our Mashiach. They must have his name and the names of the virgins to be carried through that gate, to be fitting into the tower, to be part of the first resurrection. And otherwise, you're not fit for the building of the tower. So um, all of this ties together. I highly encourage you to go over those. We've made some videos on the Shabbat studies about Shepherd of Hermas already but it's highly recommended you read that on your own and test everything for yourself. Don't just believe what other people say. If you haven't read it, then you shouldn't take a man's opinion on it unless they show it to you and prove it with multiple witnesses. And I'm showing you with multiple witnesses as I'm talking, I'm giving you other things that you can go look at to confirm the things that I'm saying, like a good Brian, just as they did. And so became believers, right? And also, if I happen to be mistaken in any point, you can correct me, because I'm not perfect yet. Number seven. They not only run to the strong tower, the name of Yahuwah, but they run into it and rest there. They hang their deliverance upon his strong nail, or upon this strong nail. They build upon this everlasting rock, here they have their rest. And that tent peg or nail put in a steadfast place upon which all the esteem of the Father's house is laid that would be taken out is mentioned explicitly in the foretellers as well. 
I don't know if he quotes it here, but that's what he's alluding to with that quote. As a sparrow and swallow built their nests on the rafters of the temple and tabernacle, and there laid their and there laid their young, so they dwell on high. Mishiach is their temple, and El's name and attributes are, as it were, the lofty pillars and high rafters of the Hekel. And Amuna, belief, builds there, resides there where neither the devil nor all the powers of Gehenum shall be able to disturb or annoy them. There they dwell safely from the fear of evil. There they lay their young and bring forth their fruit unto Elohim. Even all the fruits of Kodeshah and Zadikah, or set apartness and righteousness, which are to the praise and esteem of El. For as from him their fruit is found, Hosea 14.8 From the temple, so their fruit is to him, being dedicated to the temple, to the praise and esteem of his name that dwells therein. 8. They whom El has begun to deliver for his name's sake, as their confidence is placed only in his name, as the leading argument of their trust, so this argument will carry them through thousands of difficulties, oppositions, and impediments that seem to lie in the way of their deliverance. This name of Yahuwah will strengthen you against thousands of temptations, thousands of objections. Notwithstanding your sins, your guilt, your rebellion, your apostasy, the wrath gone out against you for sin, as it did against Yonah, in fearful streams of indignation. Yet steadfast fidelity will look again to El's set-apart Hekel, to El's set-apart name, and say, quote, Nevertheless, he delivers for his name's sake. Unquote. There are thousands of things that damp and discourage me in looking for deliverance, and if I consider them, I must despair. But with Abraham... I desire to consider nothing but El's name and word of promise. Romans 4.19 Here is one thing that can overcome all things. Oh, I hope he will deliver me for his name's sake. Have you won here? Stay here and you are safe. There is not a man fuller of El in all the world than he that is brought to nothing before Elohim, and has nothing to rely on but the great name of Yahuwah. That name never failed an inner being that trusted to it. In a word, they whom El delivers for his name's sake are brought. 1. To know his name. 2. To trust in his name. 3. To love his name. Four, to fear his name. Use four. The fourth use shall be by way of exhortation, and our exhortation shall be tendered. One, to sinners in general. Two, to believers in particular. First, to all sinners in general, O oh, sirs, does Yahuwah deliver for his name's sake? and that with a notwithstanding of innumerable sins. Then let sinners expect in his name, and fly to his name for deliverance. Question. How is this doctrine of ground of belief to all, seeing those whom El designs to deliver are only the elect, and these whom he actually delivers are only believers, how then is this doctrine to be conceived as an encouragement to all sinners to look to his name for deliverance? Answer. Deliverance is to be considered three ways, either deliverance decreed, deliverance obtained, or deliverance exhibited in the word. Deliverance decreed concerns the elect indeed, and the election shall obtain. But thus it is not the first object of any man's belief. 
who are elect in is a secret, and secret things belong to Elohim. The elect have the knowledge of the Kodeshim, and it mentions explicitly in the prayer of the intelligent from the apostolic constitutions that all these things has he given to his elect, all the hidden things of knowledge and wisdom to truly know the Mashiach, to have true revelation of who he is, is the secret that was hidden before the mystery that was revealed in the co in the Kodeshim or the esteem of his name, right? But who are the elect is a secret, and secret things belong to Elohim. You are not concerned with deliverance as it lies in the decree. Deliverance obtained is what concerns believers, and this is not the object of any man's steadfast fidelity either, but rather the object of the sense of them who have it when they know they have it. Yes, deliverance exhibited in the word, sorry, yet, deliverance exhibited in the word is what every man that hears the good news is concerned with, deliverance promised, deliverance offered in the general dispensation of the Basora, with a particular invitation to everyone to look for Mashiach or to Mashiach for deliverance. Now, to lay hold of deliverance here as it lies in the word is the safe way for you to take. If you lay hold on deliverance exhibited to you in the word, then you will come to find it, it deliverance obtained. And when you find it deliverance obtained, then you may find it deliverance decreed. And this is the right order in which you ascend to Yahuwah's decree by taking hold of his word, when to you the word of this deliverance is sent. See Romans 6, 7, and 8, quote, Say not even in thine heart, unquote. Or sorry, who shall ascend to Shemaim to see that if deliverance has was decreed for me? Or who shall descend into the deep, to the heart, to see if deliverance is a or be obtained. You will find no object of belief in yourself, but the word is nigh, the word of deliverance which we preach. Quote, it is in your mouth and in your heart to do it, unquote. To be acknowledged with the mouth and embraced with the heart. Verse 9. Then, sinner, his word which you are called to take hold of is his name. It is that whereby he makes himself known. Fly to his name and look for deliverance as it is in his word, in his name. And in coming to him for deliverance, one, let his name be your motive, for thus you will esteem his name. Two, let his name be your tower to which you fly for deliverance. Three, let his name be the measure of your expectation, how much he will be esteemed in delivering you. So much let your, expect, or your hope and expectation go forth that he will do so. Four, let his name be your plea and argument. Quote, what will you do for your great name? Unquote. Yet, Yahushua 7, 9, quote, Deliver for your name's sake, unquote. Father, esteem your name. That was what our Mashiach said, right, when he was in the flesh. Cast anchor here, and you shall ride out all storms and be eternally safe. Secondly, we find tender our exhortation to believe, or sorry, secondly, <clears throat> We tender our exhortation to believers, in particular, who have run to this strong tower for deliverance, the name of Yahuwah. Admire his Tobim. Admire his name. He knows all your sins against him and against his name. Yet for his name's sake, he shows unmerited tender loving kindness. And that's also translated as mercy in English. It's the word chesed. In Hebrew, 
Chesed, like the Hashmanians, were the kind ones or the dedicated that served Yahuwah that were also clung to the Maccabees in the times of their persecution. But it's his lovingly kind ones that are alluded to, the Chesedim, which um, it's also related to the word for a stork. That's mentioned by Yob. There, there's parables there to look at. I'm just alluding to them here. You can read them at your leisure, okay? He says, let sin against so Tob and El be abhorred. Let his goodness lead you to repentance more and more. Quote, the earth is full of the goodness of Yahuwah, unquote. Believer, are you called by his name? Praise him for his unmerited, tender, loving kindness, truth, steadfast fidelity. Quote, according to your name, O Elohim, so is your praise unto the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness, unquote. Psalm 18.10 Sirs, ascribe all the unmerited, tender, loving kindness you meet with to his name and study to be meet objects for El's name, to be more and more esteemed upon his engaging his name for your help. Meaning when you call on his name and he helps you and other men see that, they see that you're not walking in a way that is affronting to him, but you're a light to the nations because of your humble obedience to the truth in humility, right? That's the whole point. The perfect example is our Mashiach when he walked out for us. Study to become such men as the scriptures require. For those sinners have a ground of expectation that he may do for his name's sake, yet Kodashim have a ground of expectation that he will do for his name's sake. And whatever you do, or whatever you ask for in belief, he will give you, right? Because And he says that we know we have the petitions we ask for because we're doing what's pleasing in his sight. These things are made very clear. Yahu Kanan, Har Mashiach, they, they talk about these things. It is what is emphatically proven throughout the book of Acts and Recognitions. The humble obedience of those men after he came and gave them the truth was what enabled him to do his, his will and his mighty works through them. He answered their prayers even before they asked. Right? The favorless may run to him with hope that he may begin the good work for his name's sake, but the favored may run to him with hope that he will perfect the good work for his name's sake. His name is engaged. In a word, improve his name in every case, for he has a name suiting every want, every need. Do you need wonders to be wrought for you? His name is wonderful. Look to him so to do for his name's sake. Do you need counsel and direction? His name is the counselor. Cast yourself on him and his name for this. Have you mighty enemies to debate with? His name is the mighty L. Seek that he may exert his power for his name's sake. Do you need his father's pity? Or do you need his fatherly pity? His name is an everlasting father. And this is actually a mistranslation that is sadly used to make people come to the wrong conclusion that our Mashiach is the everlasting father, his, his own father, when he explicitly says that the father is greater. When you look at the other versions of this in the uh, different translations of scripture, the Septuagint and other ones, it mentions that he is the father of a future age or the father of continuance, as it calls it. And this is absolutely true. As the father above is the one in whom all fatherhood is named, our Mashiach brought forth the world and all creation. He's carried it through to this time to make his everlasting possession for himself. And in that capacity, he is the father of a future age. So it is absolutely true. But um, this is where it says everlasting father as a title for our Mashiach is not accurate.
It says, his name is the father of a future age. As a father pities his children, so Yahuwah pities them that fear him, unquote. Plead his pity for his name's sake. And our father above is the everlasting father, right? The father of lights with whom there is no change, no shadow of turning. But that isn't our Mashiach. So I just wanted to make the distinction there. Do you need shalom external, internal, or eternal? His name is Shar Shalom or Prince of Shalom. Seek for his name's sake that he may create shalom. Do you need healing? Sirs, his name is Yahuwah Rafi or Yahuwah Rafa. Yahuwah the healer and physician. For his name's sake, or seek for his name's sake that he may heal all your diseases. Do you need pardon? His name is Yahuwah Zadikanu, Yahuwah our righteousness. Seek for his name's sake that he may be hesedi or lovingly kind to your unrighteousness. Do you need defense and protection? His name is Yahuwah Nisi. Yahuwah, your banner, or our banner, right? Seek for his name's sake that his banner of love and favor may be spread over you. Do you need provision in extreme want? His name is Yahuwah Yaira. In the mount of Yahuwah, it shall be seen. Yahuwah will provide. Do you need his presence? His name is Yahuwah Shema, Yahuwah is there. Emmanuel, that is El with us, look to him to be with you for his name's sake. Do you need audience of prayer? His name is the hearer of prayer. Do you need strength? His name is the strength of Yisrael. Do you need comfort? His name is the consolation of Yisrael. Do you need shelter? His name is a city of refuge. Have you nothing and need all? His name is all in all. Sit down and devise names to your wants and needs, and you will find he has a name suitable thereunto for your supply. He has chokmah to guide you and power to keep you, unmerited tender loving kindness to pity you, truth to shield you, set apartness to set you apart, righteousness to declare you right, favor to adorn you, and esteem to crown you. Trust in his name, who delivers for his name's sake. So thank you for that very much. And then for anyone that might want to see it, um, I don't know if you can see it very well. Sorry about that. This is the article that was part that, I'm sorry. This was the article that I have about their mother having them after she was dead and buried and came back from the dead. I can share that with anyone that might want it. But in the meantime, we're going to stop for questions real quick, and then I'll find that other section. So just one. All right, so thank you. Before we finish for today, I'd like to read this little segment. This is an excerpt or just part of a larger writing from Clement of Alexandria on who the rich man is that will be saved. Okay. And for context of what that was all about and why he has that title, you have to read the work itself. But this particular part is showing our creator's benevolence and forgiving sin and overlooking rebellion and transgression and in, in, in great evil on the part of believers. And it says, and that you may be still more confident that repenting thus truly, there remains for you a sure hope of deliverance. Listen to a tale which is not a tale, but a narrative handed down and committed to the custody of memory about the emissary, Yahukanon. For when on the tyrant's death, meaning Domitian, he returned to Ephesus from the Isles of Patmos, 
he went away being invited to the contiguous territories of the nations. Here to appoint overseers, there to set in order whole assemblies, there to ordain such as were marked out by the Ruach. Having come to one of the cities not far off, the name of which some give, and having put the brethren to rest in other matters, at last looking to the overseer appointed, and seeing a youth, powerful in body, comely in appearance, and ardent, said, This I commit to you in all earnestness in the presence of the assembly, and with Mashiach as witness, and on his accepting and promising all, he gave the same injunction and testimony. And he set out for Ephesus, and the elder taking home the youth committed to him, reared, kept, cherished, and finally immersed him. After this, he relaxed with his stricter care and guardianship under the idea that the seal of Yahuwah, the seal of Yahuwah meaning the immersion and the receiving of the Ruach, it's what Gad the seer calls his seal as well. But it says, under the idea that the seal of Yahuwah he had set upon him was a complete protection to him, but on his obtaining premature freedom, some youths of his age, idle, desolate, and adepts in evil courses corrupt him. First, they entice him by many costly entertainments. Then afterwards, by night issuing forth for highway robbery, they take him along with them. Then they dared to execute together something greater. And he, by degrees, got accustomed. And from greatness of nature, when he had gone aside from the right path, and like a hard-mouthed and powerful horse, had taken the bit between his teeth, rushed with all the more force down into the depths. And having entirely despaired of deliverance in Elohim, he no longer meditated what was insignificant. But having perpetrated some great exploit, now that he was once lost, he made up his mind to a like fate with the rest taking them and forming a band of robbers. He was the prompt or he was the prompt captain of the bandits, the fiercest, the bloodiest, the cruelest. Time passed and some necessity having emerged, they send again for Yahukanon. He, when he had settled the other matters on account of which he came, said, Come now, overseer, Restore to us the deposit which I and the Deliverer committed to you in the face of the assembly over which you preside as witness. The other was at first confounded, thinking that it was a false charge about money which he did not get, and he could neither believe the allegation regarding what he had not, nor disbelieve Yahukanon. But when he said, I demand the young man and the inner being of the brother, the old man groaning deeply and bursting into tears, said he is dead. How and what kind of death he is dead, he said to Elohim. For he turned wicked and abandoned, and at last a robber, and ha now has taken possession of the mountain in front of the assembly, along with a band like him, rending therefore his clothes and striking his head with great lamentation, the emissary said, It was a fine guard of a brother's inner being I left. But let a horse be brought me, and let some one be my guide on the way. And he rode away just as he was straight from the assembly. And you can see the love of Mashiach through his emissary here. On coming to the place, he is arrested by the robbers. 
sorry, by the robber's outpost, neither fleeing nor entering, but crying. It was for this I came. Lead me to your captain, who meanwhile was waiting, all armed as he was. But when he recognized Yahu Kanan, as he advanced, he turned ashamed to flight. The other followed with all his might, forgetting his age, crying, Why, my son, do you flee from me, your father? Unarmed, old, son, pity me. Fear not, you have still expectation of life. I will give account to Mashiach for you. If need be, I will willingly endure your death, as Yahuwah did death for us. For you will surrender, or for you, I will surrender my life. Stand, believe, Mashiach has sent me. And that's another thing that was uh, mentioned multiple times throughout the epistles of Ignatius. He says, my inner being for yours. And he said that to those that he was intimate with amongst believers. And he, when he heard, first stood looking down, then threw down his arms and trembled and wept bitterly. And on the old man approaching, he embraced him, speaking for himself with lamentations as he could, and immersed a second time with tears, concealing only his right hand, the other pledging and assuring him on oath that he would find forgiveness for himself from the Deliverer, beseeching and falling on his knees and kissing his right hand itself, as now purified by repentance, led him back to the assembly. Then by supplicating with copious prayers, and striving along with him in continual fastings, and subduing his mind by various utterances of word, did not depart, as they say, till he restored him to the assembly, presenting in him a great example of true repentance and a great token of regeneration, a trophy of the resurrection for which we hope when at the end of the world the messengers radiant with joy, hemming and opening the Shemaim, shall receive into the celestial abodes those who truly repent. And before all, the Deliverer himself goes to meet them, welcoming them, holding forth the shadowless, ceaseless light, conducting them to the Father's bosom, to eternal life, to the Malkuth Shemaim. All right, and I appreciate you allowing me to read that as well. I can't vouch for the the efficacy of all his writings or his belief in doctrine, but this story right here stands out as a testament to itself, and you can look at that in Scripture and, and judge for yourselves what you think. But Ob willing, you can see that this is a perfect example of his benevolent attributes in seeking to deliver men for his name's sake. So you all have a wonderful Shabbat, and we will see you next time. Shabbat